The Mark IV is the tank Britain makes the most of in World War I. Over a thousand of these are made. It follows on that classic rhomboid shape that you see with the Mark I tank. The rhomboid shape, it's there so it can crush the wire down underneath as it goes forward. And hopefully as well, in the early models, this would allow you to actually cross the width of a German trench. What they improve on with the Mark IV is they make the armour thicker. It's now about 12 millimetres thick. The tank goes pretty much at the same speed as the Mark I, about 3.7 miles an hour at top speed. Still got a crew of eight. We're still armed with six pounder guns, although on the Mark IV, these are shortened. And we still have female tanks as well, which are just armed with machine guns. Inside the Mark IV, there would have been an eight-man crew. Four guys are needed just to drive the vehicle, and there's two men each side on the sponsons. They're manning the guns. Now, the engine, this is a 105-horsepower Daimler engine. It's a petrol engine. Once it starts running, all conversation in the space ceases. It's just so noisy. So everything has to be done by hand signals, kicks, or shouting in people's ears. The exhausts that run through the top of the engine into the roof, they glow red hot after about half an hour's running. They've had temperatures recorded up to 120 Fahrenheit or about uh, 50 degrees centigrade. That is ridiculously hot. One of the hottest places on earth was recorded as that. So the guys themselves are gonna get very warm very quickly. Now here is a differential. I'm actually sitting on the starting handle. Four of the soldiers are needed just to turn that to get this engine going. And there is no suspension at all. So when we maneuver along, everything we're going to fill. We're gonna be rocking all over the place. And as you can see, this is very much pre-health and safety. This vehicle, it's empty of most of its kit. Sometimes they put extra fuel on the roof. There's a bit of a risk there, as you can imagine, if they're hit by shell fire or penetrated by machine guns, that petrol can run down onto things such as hot exhausts. I'm sitting now in the driver's position. We'd be going in this direction. Driver sits here. The commander, normally a young officer, a second lieutenant, would sit in this seat, again looking forward. And there'd be two extra soldiers to drive the tank, gearsmen, who are at the back. And quite simply, it's a very complex piece of equipment to drive. Um, we've got to alert the attention of the gearsman if we want to turn left or right. And normally that was done by the officer with something like a spanner in his hand to bash the metalwork and then give a hand signal, one or two, left or right, to the gearsman to indicate we're going to turn. And then the driver has to disengage the clutch pedal down here the commander would actually use one of the levers in front of him to pull back, to brake on one side of the track. And you can see here the gear levers they would be using to maneuver and disengage the engine drive from the rear sprocket that's driving those tracks along, allowing us to turn. Just in front of the gearsman's position, just here, this is where we'd have two gunners on either side. Um, you've got a loader, they'd be picking up the six pounder rounds just about this size. Uh, six pounder, the weight a shot of the projectile. Nowadays we judge the gun on the size of the hole on the barrel, about a 57 millimeter as a six pounder gun. And you can see all around the vehicle there's stowage points for the six pounder ammunition. Now if you're on a female tank, you would have Lewis guns or Hotchkiss guns here on the sponsons. And again, there's spaces all around for boxes of ammunition to supply those weapons. The six pounder here, um, loader and gunner. The gunner is looking through this site. It's a two time site. And he'd be using this piece here to push and elevate or depress the gun. And from side to side, he leans his body weight on it to get traverse. Now the truth is, one of these guns here, the gunner is gonna find it very, very hard to find a target to actually fire at. He uses this little pistol grip here to actually fire when he's seen something. And the problem there, of course, is, is on those First World War battlefields, not only is it hard to actually see anything in the front line to fire at, you're actually going from a very, very unbalanced position. You're gonna be feeling everything as you go over. 
So the only chance this gun has really got of hitting something accurately is if he gets the commander's attention, stops the tank, or sometimes it was the other way around. The commander would stop the vehicle, indicate to the gunner where he can fire his six pounder rounds. Now, we've actually got a seat up here at the front. Our visibility through this aperture, which would be closed when we were going into action, would be very minimal because we end up then looking through a tiny periscope going forward. The front here, we get a bit of fresh air coming through from the front. The rest of the crew are slowly going to be poisoned by carbon monoxide. Those fumes are coming out the engine all the time. They don't all make it through the exhaust into the roof. So again, that was another thing that crews had to be aware of, slowing down during the course of a day in a tank as you're inhaling all this poisonous carbon monoxide fumes. The chaps only realized they'd got that when they got outside afterwards. If they survive, of course, the battle, they get outside, they breathe in fresh air and you start vomiting. That's a classic symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning.